Welcome to Next Future Today, hosted by Dan Keltson, co-founder of PlexiCam.com. Find more episodes at nextfuturetoday.com, on YouTube, or in your favorite podcast app. All right, let's dive on into it. Hey Joe, so welcome to Next Future Today. We finally, it took a couple months for us to, uh, to make this happen, but it's great to see you and, and have a chance to talk to you. Great. Thanks, Dan. And thanks for inviting us on it. Yeah. And I love, we already talked about this uh, in the beginning, but I love your, your home office view there. Very, very nice. Looks like you thank get you. more sunlight than <laughs> I probably do. <laughs> Great. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so uh, the, the, the sort of point of Next Future Today, I, um, in a twist of irony, I came up with the idea for this podcast back in March of 2020, right. which seems like yesterday. And somehow oh, it was yeah. two years ago. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. But, um, but so I had, it's uh, the ironic part is, so I came up with, you know, so at that point we were a couple of weeks into lockdowns all around the world. Nobody knew what was going to happen. It could, it could be done in a week. Yeah. It could be done in never, yeah. it, you know? So uh, uh, one phrase or one saying that I've always uh, enjoyed is, you know, the best time to plant a tree is 80 years ago. The next best time is to plant yeah. one today. So next yes. future today is is a twist on that, and I was busily interviewing people to get a sense as how are leaders of various different size organizations, public, private, tiny, huge, nonprofit, whatever, what are they doing in March of 2020 that was very different than what they thought they were going to do at January 1st, 2020? And I talked oh, yeah, to a bunch question. of fun people. Yeah, it was. Yeah. I wish I had actually recorded all of them and published it because that would have been brilliant yeah, amazing. <laughs> very useful but yeah. i got tied up creating two companies and i didn't have time to do a podcast so i finally started it uh last last fall and it's still the same mission so part of what i like to do i'm interested in, in a lot of different things i've had a strange wandering path of a, of a career which I, th- I guess most people do have but i sometimes go even deeper into the recesses <laughs> than a lot of people so i don't i don't remember exactly how i stumbled onto you but the idea I'm, I'm very much interested in wordplay and what's the different meanings of words and you know all uh, this is sometimes blows people mind but all words are made up right so yeah. <laughs> the new ones come all the time and as an author and as anybody who's trying to inf- influence things you need something that's going to stick in people's minds so the concept yeah. of engineering i love that right off the bat it makes you think what the hell is that <laughs> and Excellent. why why would you want that uh, you know the end is usually like there's a negative connotation to a lot of endings that doesn't have to be that's you know i think that's some baggage we potentially have to unpack but how did you get started in beginning this business that you're in of creating endings or helping people to see them so i guess like uh many sort of wacky ideas um (laughs) when years ago i'd done a short project about i called it closure experiences back then and that was mm-hmm. very much based on the user experience of closure and how that felt to people. And, and that was sort of interesting. And this is way back, like ni- the 1990s, I think, 95 wow. maybe. And uh, I found that super interesting. And then I went off, done my career. And always in the background, I was, all, and I was, I was working in tech and user experience and stuff. And um, I started to think about that in the background a lot and picking up ideas. And then I had an opportunity around 2014 to me and my wife swap roles. So I was started looking after the kids. Uh, she wanted to get back to work. I also wanted to have another project and do something else. And so I picked this theme of endings up and, and I looked at it in a far more holistic, I guess, um, deeper, wider way and far more historically. And then I started looking into death and, uh, and why we don't think about endings currently, as you point out, especially in, in businesses and consumerism. And I started right. taking that journey way back in, and the focus being Northern Europe because the Industrial Revolution started there, but taking that, what happened? Why don't we do this? And it goes right back to the plague of Protestant uprising. And then I take it forward through Industrial Revolution and really start framing that and started, I ended up, I didn't want to write a book. This is way back in the first book, um, Ends. I didn't want yep. to write a book at all. I'm pretty dyslexic. So that was uh-huh. not on my agenda. I thought yeah. I have to tell this story. This is such a fascinating reframing of how we 
uh, are terrible at doing consumerism currently, where we've got so <laughs> many open problems with lack, lack of endings. And so mm. that built from there, and that's really the essence of it, is that it goes right back to that. And so I've been building on this theme and putting more foundations into it until I feel I feel very confident with it now to I started a business and um, you know I now do loads of talks and training around it so yeah it's uh, it's fascinating and I'm, I love the fact that you like the word engineering as well yeah I, it's it's such a neat uh, I mean that's that's one of the to me that's one of the biggest things that people need to pay attention to is you you if you cannot get something in somebody's head they're never going to follow through on whatever it is, you know, some sort of behavior change around weight or whatever, uh, or in a consumer journey, if you like, I, I agree with you, and, and we'll get into more of this, I'm sure, but the, there's been so much attention paid to, and in my mind, thank God, it's been paid to the, on the front. I do most yeah. of the work I've done in the past has been around employee experiences and things like that, yeah. which was, yeah. uh, as you probably know, lagged way behind on the consumerism yeah. front. And you know, oh, welcome aboard. Go sit in your office and figure out what to do. That's you know that's what yeah. the standard <laughs> yeah. was and still is in a lot of ways. But yeah, yeah. Um, it it didn't occur to me as somebody who sort of stumbled into uh, I went to like out of IT into doing usability, some IT being more like desktop support and hardware and, and yeah, yeah. that kind of stuff systems, uh, yeah. and then going into usability and then realizing usability it's not enough to know if that button should be green should that button even be there. Well, user experience, yeah. and then on and on. Yeah, on. yeah. <laughs> um, and I follow. Do you know uh, Amy Jo Kim at all? She's uh, she's known from the gamification world. I don't know. I might well do. I mean, yeah. It's quite it's quite a small community globally, isn't it? The US yeah. Community, so I, yeah, I might well do. Okay, so I, so I just bring her up because gamification, which used to be, yeah. I, you know, you couldn't turn around and not hear it a million times a day, but it's calmed yeah. down now. But, um, yeah, that's a bit, thank you know, goodness. <laughs> yeah, but I, but there's some great stuff in there. Like, you know, it was. the beginning is not, is not the entire story. There's a middle, I think. Yeah. There's clearly an end. I know that yeah. personally, I haven't really paid much attention to endings, uh, which I, yeah. now that I've read your book, I'm realizing, oh crap, there's, <laughs> there's a bunch of things I should do. But the middle is where you, uh, like gamification cycles talk about re engagement. Yeah. So you, yeah. if you're going to level people up through a game and make money from subscriptions, how do you keep people engaged? And you do not want an end necessarily, unless that end leads yeah. into the next version of the game, right? Uh, which yeah. is sort of sort of creepy. But um, the <laughs> so the whole to me, it's it's funny. So you mentioned that starting, and I saw some of the reviews about your closure uh, experiences or, or whatever the the title was that you're using. That and people were raving about it. I didn't realize it was that long ago, <laughs> which is. At, at the yeah, 90s I've been also doing seem this like for a while now. So it's, yeah, and, and bringing the so the first book came out in uh, 2017, and then I've okay. done a lot of conferences and meeting a load of people and training. Obviously, the last couple of years has been a bit rubbish on that, but I've moved online quite easily. And mm -hmm. the most recent book, the engineering book, that came out last November, so it's only been out um, what three four months. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think it's. It is time. I think the the pandemic has forced people to rethink things. You know that that could have easily been ignored, like uh, throughout history. If there's ever a down period, a recession, depression, whatever, yeah. the organizations that really push forward are the ones that survive, among other things, and they usually really just blow away their competition that maybe slammed on the brakes, which was part of the reason yeah. for me coming up with the next future today. Um, but you know, so I'd say. Let's say in the last 20 years is really when consumer experience has been like a discipline and, and something that's talked about in not enough companies, in my opinion, but in a lot of companies. Um, yeah. I think some of the classics that we could point people to are uh, Apple is has yeah. been very good about customer experience and consumer experience of the devices, but also like the Apple stores, which if you remember when those started, most people thought it was the stupidest thing they'd ever heard of. Why would Apple? have a dedicated store in every mall and around the world. It seemed idiotic. And then Microsoft came along, duplicated it badly. I don't think Microsoft stores even exist anymore, which, which is interesting that you can't just take that same kind of model. But yeah, it's funny so, to, easy to forget how pioneering the Apple stores were, like when, yeah. when they first came out. So neat and tidy and really nice to hang out in. <laughs> yeah. 
And it turns out that, you know, they, they're actually the ones that I've been in anyhow, um, are set up so that, so things like social distancing is actually relatively easy because they're, they yeah. tend to be big open spaces, which is fascinating how sometimes if you can envision, I don't know if they were specifically envisioning, you know, how do you survive in a pandemic? But if you can think forward to a couple alternative endings, potentially, um, what happens when something, you know, a uh, black swan happens uh, like that and that, that uh, you need to really rejigger yourself potentially <clears throat> instantaneously. I think that's that's pretty interesting. Um, so there's sort of Apple, I think, is a great example. Um, I think maybe partly because I had the interesting experience of going to a Disney World in Florida uh, last month, which was the first time I'd been on a plane. Oh, that's cool. Two years. Um, I don't know if you saw in the last book, um, I did do a, there was a, when, um, there's a component of um, endings that happen in terms of we celebrate, have a, a great big crescendo. And hmm. Disney does that great. At the end of every day, they have a massive fireworks event. And right. um, when it was uh, the pandemic, obviously they canceled a load of that because they shut down the, the parks. But it right. said on the invite ticket, um, um, I think it was, and they, they canceled it. I can't remember what they said on it. It was really funny. I'm just going to reference it here. Here you go. Sure. Um, <laughs> happily ever after, temporary, unavailable. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah. It. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. That's funny. I, uh, that's in your first book? Or is, or is oh, that in the engineering? The, in the engineering book. But... Okay. Because I was going to say, I definitely, I knew what you were talking about. I couldn't remember the phrase. Um, and I have not yeah. read your, your first book. So I was like, boy, that sounds, I know what he's talking about. What it was it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I thought that was a really good bit of copy because it was quite warm and um, I think quite reflective about where we all are in, in, that, in, the, in the pandemic. Right. Yeah. So I, I think there's there's certainly the sort of prototypical companies that really they they definitely get it. You know, like Disney does celebrate endings. They they celebrate peak experiences. There's the, you know, they are constantly working to make sure that you're engaged and you're going to stay in the park yeah. and spend a billion dollars on Disney <laughs> materials. Um, are there are there any other of your favorite sort of examples that are not potentially at that, you know, like the been around a hundred years think, sort of level? I think what I've observed is a lot of the, um, the consumer experience world is there's some components of that are people from theater. And when you get into rich narrative structure, like storytelling, they mm. often do good endings. And because we've been telling stories for millennia, that that's often a really good ending. And a, a lot of the influence from that sort of theater experience comes into um, consumer experience. And, and like, I mean, Joe Pine and the experience economy, that was a foundational bit of work when I was a student and um, mm. I, I, it still inspires me today. And what I find interesting as you move um, into other sectors, for example, you see um, more failure around the responsibility of endings. And um, I think some of the worst of those is in physical products. And, but we also see it in digital where we are um, encouraging people to, for, for example, I worked in tech for a good couple of decades and, and um, the amount of products I shipped or designs I'd done where I, we were pushing the consumer into create a picture, share a picture, share a picture, you know, create a, and it would just be that rattling on and on and on. And I don't know if any of us ever created a thing which said unshare this picture or delete this. I, I don't oh, remember yeah. those conversations happening as much as how passionate we were about people sharing these pictures into right. this into this place that you'll never get that content back from. And you right. do see it with the with physical the physical product world um, in in terms of. Uh, like cars, for example, I often reference Kaya cars and their seven year warranty, which I think is a, a, I don't know if they've done that consciously, but I don't think they did. I think um, that's a perfect ending in terms of the experience for the human to say, there's a destination for this. There's, a, there's an event that's gonna happen in the future where we'll come together again at the end of this product's life. And that's where mm -hmm. we need to be really, is that coming together again, as a provider and a consumer to resolve and neutralize the negative consequences of that consumption. 
And, right. And I, I think that's uh, critically important. Yeah. Well, so I, I'm, so I definitely, so one of the things I'm doing as I interview people for Next Future Today is talking about storytelling. So that's, yeah. uh, I was, I was wondering if, uh, I didn't see it come up necessarily in the, in the book, but I do wonder, so I just, um, I'm going to be releasing, it'll be released by the time this, this, uh, is out, but I interviewed, uh, Rich Mulholland who, uh, lives in South Africa. He has a book, his most wow. recent book is called Here Be Dragons. Fantastic guy. We had a lot of fun. Oh, cool. Um, and, uh, he's, he's specifically talking about storytelling for a sales purpose. And he references things like like this this book, uh, Save the Cat by Blake Snyder. Let's see if we can get it to focus okay. here. Focus, there we go. So this this is actually the newest extension of his his idea, which is uh, Save the Cat is uh, is apparently used as like a guidebook for Hollywood scripts and TV series and oh, things like that. Brilliant. So if if you haven't hit this mile marker, like you have met your guide. You know the the you know whoever it is you know, you've met Yoda or somebody like that. Uh, if you if that if that hasn't happened by this percentage through the script, then you probably lost your audience. And there's this seems creepy to me, but there are studios that if they they take it very literally. So if it has not happened, they flip open to that part of the script and they don't see that happening. They're like, nope, uh, we are not interested in your pitch. Get out of here. Uh, so that's a little creepy to me and in, in mechanical. But I like the idea that. You can, yeah. one, you should tell a compelling story that does keep people engaged on the edge of their seat and eventually resolves, which yeah. you don't usually have. I can't think of any movie that just, da 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 the end. And you're like, wait, what? Exactly. <laughs> and, and the power and emotion and meaning in those last sort of few minutes of a film, the resolution and bringing all that together, we miss out on all of that in loads of consumer experiences where we we do fall off this cliff of meaning. So the mm. consumer feels abandoned at that point. They end up having, like, feeling lost in terms of what they should do in resolution of, say, uh, recycling or offsetting carbon or what should I do to clear up my data online? They've been abandoned. They ha are uninstructed. And that's how we leave it. Yet there is, as you point out, such a lot of, potential brand equity in that ending relationship having a good ending has the most enormous potential for businesses and their brands and they, they could really do so much work there so i think first movers into this sort of area where you're going to do not just recycling or reclaiming but you're going to put meaning and experience into that offboarding experience then that's going to be the most incredible uh, businesses on a on a brand level Right. So do you, th do you think, is there uh, in the companies you've heard about or worked with directly, who owns kind of that, uh, like, is there, are they keeping in mind a storyline or several storylines as they build out their customer experience? Does, do, do they really consciously think about storytelling or I, something I like that? I think they do it. At the end, I think um, what we've done, and especially as we've created more global, global businesses, uh, let's take Apple as a as a for, for example, they have an incredible story, brand presence, onboarding, and usage period. So, like as we were talking about the shops, what a great, unique, and I know I'm in an Apple store. That's like incredible experience. Right. But offboarding, I get told by Apple, uh, we take your phone back and we we take it to bits with robots. We do this sort of thing with it. But the trouble is, is that that moment where apple take my phone back or do something uh like dismantle it that's sort of after i've left the relationship mm. so between having a poorer and poorer relationship uh, poor and poorer user experience with the apple products so for example my phone starts to slow the battery is not so capable and this can happen in laptops and any other thing as well right. i'm not helped at that point yet at the onboarding and setup situation They've got incredibly bit, good bits of software that help you onboard your consumer right. experience. But that offboard experience from usage to the end, that's what we're looking at. And that's where the meaning and emotion and that support can really, really help. And right. because we've, and this goes for physical products and companies, et cetera, what we've done in consumerism across the world is 
have left that last quadrant for the consumer to work out and right. for state groups like governments etc to um resolve so they've just uh gone for local legal practices that um right that are, are then sort of unique in those regions and in i right. I get it. It's hard for businesses to align with all of those, and but we need to start working at it and trying to create a unique branded offboarding experiences that bond the consumer and the provider together. Yeah, yeah I think it's it's. Uh, I mean, I've been an Apple guy for for a very long time. Um, it is interesting. So even sort of the best at customer experiences, endings seem to be pretty difficult. Like for that that example, like you start out as. You know, it used to be the cult of Mac, which, you know, every, like, yeah, a yeah. Apple and Mac, who cares? That's like 5%, you know, 2% of the world. That's yeah. yeah, just yeah. a bunch of maniacs. And now, you know, like uh, there's plenty of people that have five Apple products for them. Yeah. <laughs> and their whole family might have that. They're an entire yeah, company. Yeah. Um, yeah, we've but, got it here. That, that's, our, that's our family. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, as an Apple stockholder, I approve. Uh, <laughs> Good. <laughs> But then, you know, like the, the recycling bit, it is, so sustainability, alternative energy, recycling, all that kind of stuff is, um, that's, that's something that I care about too. Part of what's always frustrated me is that there, there almost never seems to be, it's either like a full on emotional experience as somebody who cares about it and like, we're, you know, we're killing the planet and you know, all those kinds of things, exactly. or it's purely yeah. logistics. We're going to, yes. like you said, we're going to dismantle exactly. this and reuse the, the rare metals and whatnot um to be sustainable but absolutely they're not like and you can let's see have a party <laughs> yeah you can see that through the lens of uh waste plastic so as a consumer i never go out and buy plastics i never go i'm popping down the shop to get some plastics that never is the case of a consumer they're always going out to buy something which is task orientated or purposeful to them it right. might have plastics as a component of that and so that's the message at onboarding is go and buy these beneficial things for you. Uh, offboarding, in terms of like trying to become environmentally sensitive and better through that, we talk about plastics. So we've got this um, breakage between the vo going back to the vocabulary thing and words and meanings. Plastics yeah. don't come into onboarding and onboarding and usage experience as a consumer don't align with m much of the vocabulary at offboarding in the end. So. Right. Um, and we can take that a step further. So when I think about um, measuring my carbon impact, if you've ever tried to do that, the levels of scientific knowledge you need to get to to measure your uh, capability impact at that offboarding thing, that is deep, deep hard work there. However, yeah. at onboarding, I can measure myself very conveniently through all sorts of things because we've all grown up with it together. We've built these systems. So I know how much money I've got. I know what I like. I know what values all sorts of products have got, whether they're, you know, whether it's a lens on a camera or this type of shape shoe or this, all of these measurements we're really comfortable with and we can quickly make those convenient, consumer centric, customer centric, user centric, mm. offboarding, scientific, guilt ridden. And we've got to join those together in the same vocabulary that we create at onboarding and usage. So there's a co coherent consumer experience which goes from beginning to the end. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting how there's sort of a, uh, there's like a magic box mentality. Somebody will figure it out, not me, <laughs> if, if you're part exactly, of a company exactly. that's in the business of this. Yeah. <laughs> and I think it is hard as we, um, as globalization beds in more and more, and it's so established you know, through decades and decades, if we look at um, the onboarding of something like, uh, or, or the, the establishment of something like organic products, that has gone through many, many logistic or and trade uh, border relationships and logistic relationships to, to deliver us, the consumer, these products from way, way far, far away. But at offboarding, right. we do the same stuff with plastics to and impact those same people that might be benefiting from our uh, fair trade relationships in those same countries and right. um, even on that benevolent type of level we need to start thinking about how does uh, one value to 
relate to the other that we're sort of mm. being critical and i get it it's really going to be really hard but i think it's going to be also an interesting time to start building that reflection capability and benevolence in at the offboarding as well globally because we've done a good work on terms of sourcing stuff for many people in in the world right yeah so you think is there there uh, at least in my experience there, t there tends to be a team that cares about user experience definitely customer experience probably because it's the next logical extension of that yeah yeah but should that team owned all the way through endings or is there a standard sort of handoff that you see I, th I think um, and this comes up a bit in the engineering book, and obviously I can't speak for all businesses because uh, they're all particularly different. But I think generally the skill set that's required to have empathy at offboarding is present in the user experience community and the cust I think customer, the customer centric sort of cons customer experience community. And to apply right. that offboarding, I think partnering with um, the logistics side of the business a lot more instead of the sales marketing side. So you're just kicking into a server and getting into distribution. We're going to need to do that in reverse. So distribution goes from pickup to back to the store to dismantle or back to the factory. So there's a big uh, quadrant there that needs to be thought about. But there are the skills there we need to apply those skills and train those skills into thinking about offboarding and how that experience and relationship at the end um, really matters as well. Sure. Yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm curious if there, there's, so there's sort of a, uh, there's some, and I, I'm not a manufacturing guy. I do now have a physical product company for the first time, which is exciting and terrifying is very different than software and, and uh, consulting yeah. professional services. Um, but there's, there's, you know, this whole life cycle idea, um, there's in manufacturing, I do have some friends who are who have been in manufacturing, like at Intel and, and, and other places, where you know, the, it's a massive <laughs> operation. And they, uh, the, there's, there's like, there's different flavors of design for uh, like, it's not designed for dismantling, but there's like design for repairability, for example, uh, yes. there's like yeah, DFMM, yeah. I forget what the heck that stands for. Absolutely. But instead of just thinking about it, I think it gets to the point of endings or extending the ending or exactly. something like that. So uh, agreed, I think there is loads of capability in that, in those sectors. So um, design for disassembly, which um, comes out of, I can't remember the person there, but it was quite a pioneer who established a lot of it. For a good example is the um, screws in uh, laptops that melt when you raise it up to a top certain temperature, and then they oh. come out easily when you're dismantling it. Oh, but we're okay. also seeing which uh, stuff now um, coming into Europe, so right to repair, which has been uh, a big thing in the US, um, yep. a lot of farmers driving that from having to not being allowed to mend for example, John Deere tractors. And right. the consequences of that has moved also into uh, mobile phones, computers, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot. And I think even Biden mentioned it uh, a few months ago in terms of getting um, allowances into that. In mm. Europe, we've got right to repairs come into legislation now. France has led the way with um, putting on any, any product, especially electronic products, uh, how easy it is to repair so that's a zero to nine capability mm. i think nine being the best the easiest the easiest level so even if you go onto amazon france you can see that on you know for example the samsung product oh, okay which is okay. really good so on that level it's great to see that um right to repair i think um when we need to think about um the individual and the experience at the end and you see this with um other things in terms of if you're if you're concerned about the environment and you're concerned about wastage some people take personal action in terms of i'm going to sell this or i'm going to upcycle it etc cetera, etc cetera. Right. the issue with that and to a certain degree um mending it yourself is that you're making that decision as an individual that's not built into the wider consumer experience sure and what yeah. we need to do is move that into an industrialized uh, ending. So if I am a producer and I ship a product to you in such and such a country, 
then there's a way and, a, and an experience that I've designed that allows you to then ship that back to me. And then we resolve the relationship and we neutralize the product and we offset things or we delete the data, et cetera, et cetera. So we tidy right. it up on industrial level instead of it being my personal agenda that I think we should do this and I'm going to help the environment as an individual. Not to say that that isn't really good, but yeah. we need to do that on an industrial level. Yeah, yeah, it's not, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's great to have like a, a, a groundswell around that if you can make it. And it does take yeah. individual actions to make that happen, but it does it getting does. to the point where it really makes an impact is, you know, it just just relying on people out of the goodness of their hearts or something is yeah. probably not a plan that's going to work. <laughs> no, exactly. And I think what we've been relying on for many uh, decades, especially around the environment, is guilt. I mean, it goes right back to the mm. Indian with a tear in his eye on the earliest sort of American. Um, environmental adverts that you know right it's all about guilt and what we need to do is because it's a really hard emotion to to action guilt i mean religion has been using it for year you know, centuries <laughs> and it, yeah. it's very not actionable so um what we need to do is make very actionable user-centric offboarding things that help people encourage people to to do something and get in there and uh, have that good ending and I think with right. businesses, there's just an a enormous opportunity to create these very brand centric offboarding things, which build brand equity. And it, we're capable of doing it. I think a good example is um, the fashion industry. So mm. uh, as much as fast fashions uh, criticized, I think one thing they've done quite well in the last few years is build a logistic system that allows them to ship a product out, someone to test it try it on and very easily ship it back so when you take that logic and that capability to the end of the consumer life cycle on all products we should be able to ship products back equally capable and uh with a very good experience built around it right yeah yeah i think it's um, and i think about this sometimes so like uh zappos you know was famously acquired by amazon for a billion dollars oh, yeah. uh, there was a period in time where every acquisition by anybody was like $1.2 billion. I don't know why that was. <laughs> but uh, on the one hand, you have Amazon is great from the buying experience. Only yeah. recently, from what I can tell, have they cared about the you know, full, fuller life cycle of customer experience. Yeah. Like for, trying to return things before yeah. the pandemic was not a lot yeah. of fun. It was hard to figure out how to do that. It's become well, very right. easy, right? Right now, which meant they had to address um, you know, how do we do that at a larger scale than we're yeah. used to? Because, you know, people would try, they're, they're stuck in their homes. They're automatically hitting buy now <laughs> every day, yeah. which probably is not a good thing. But if they decide they don't want it, then there, there better be a, a useful way to make it easy, maybe even pleasant to return something back to them. And, and the, on the other hand, I, Zappos was built because it's the most caring company around, right? For You can return it whenever the hell you want. <laughs> right. Take 10 yeah, shoes. Of course. Yeah. We'll take them back. So it's it's funny that it's it doesn't seem to have crossed the barrier there between they're still very different companies, um, yeah. so that's, that's just I, I think very, that's very a good curious. example where there is this capability, especially in clothes and fashion, where we can get these things back to the store and dismantle, and that's what we should really be doing, not relying on charity, goodwill, uh, personal right. personal sort of um, uh, energy. Really, it should be an industrial sized model that we can all get behind right we'll, we'll start creating them in our own businesses yeah so I, I guess so one thing i was thinking about for for endings is there's not one ending in a customer experience right so you could you could have sort of an aborted ending but like so in doing returns so you buy something the return window is 15 days or whatever it is yeah. and you decide as a as a customer you don't want it so how easy do you make it not just to return it or get a refund or whatever the process is, but to part ways as a friend, instead yeah. of being treated like human scum, like, <laughs> you know, like, yeah, you know, yeah. those, the uh, dark patterns that you talk about in the book, uh, you know, okay, if you can figure out how to cancel your cable, congratulations, yeah. <laughs> you're one in a million. Yeah. That's, that's not good. <laughs> so and do I you think, think is there sort of stages of endings that you should uh, yes, ultimately be thinking exactly. about? So, so to help and 
I think like anything, when we start talking about something in a philosophical sense, it, is, it becomes really difficult to get anywhere. So when I done <laughs> the first book, it really helped me doing the first book, think about the history, uh, the, the psychology around that. I did. I mentioned storytelling in that in that book, only a chapter, oh, okay. a, bit, a bit about games. Um, sure. But that that laid foundations for me psychologically. And then I was able to, through discussion and meeting people and I was researching more I started to lay some foundational sort of models and hmm. I think that starts to help people really action it so um in the book in the second book the engineering book which is very much more how to do it is um hmm. eight different ways that we commonly experience endings as a consumer and one thing which we do in businesses all the time and we're really good at is talk about competitive endings so you can hmm. comfortably go into any business meeting and go, oh, this competitor's this, and this competitor, and we're losing people to, and they'll never talk about any other type of ending. <laughs> so right. what we need to do is start to talk about the characteristics of different endings. So when you, um, when your consumers have a particular type of ending, you understand the characteristics of that, and you started to design either counterpoints to that, or start to work out how they move away from the product and have a good, comfortable off-boarding experience. So the second stuff I do um, is the phases of the end. So there's different seven different phases that the consumer goes through from, and these go across service product and digital product. Um, and these are sort of um, constructions that we can all get behind and think about, okay, I can design around something around this period in the consumer offboarding experience, this period, this period. And then you can start building your story as a brand. So I, tell companies quite often that what you really need to think about this is not do this in a piecemeal fashion you as much as you have a brand equity at one end of the consumer relationship and you have foundational brand elements that you um you aspire to you've got to take that to endings and um right i example one company in the book where their some of their um, brand equity promises were things like transparency and the um, team which were responsible, they thought like, why are we transparent everywhere else, but not at the end of our customer life cycle? Yeah. Because they were doing the dark pattern stuff as well. Right. And, and they started to design a beautiful ending. They called it the beautiful exit, I think. And, um, huh. and then once they executed that and they launched it, uh, then um, they felt a lot more comfortable with their brand promise that it was open and transparent at both ends of the customer oh, okay. journey. So, you can take cool. your things one maybe one good thing to do really quickly as a company is to how much does your brand promise look at the end because most companies yeah. it's terrible right <laughs> yeah we're transparent up until we're a brick wall <laughs> uh, exactly and so many businesses are like that yeah i like that Be beautiful exit that's uh so one of one of my companies is plexicam.com uh so it's essentially if you took a tripod or a teleprompter setup, flipped it upside down, and you could hang it off your screen instead of taking up desk space or floor space or whatever, and it's completely transparent, that's that's what we do, and um, it's it solves a need. The timing was fantastic, <laughs> ironic, yeah. because we started up during the <laughs> pandemic, so that yeah, was not planned. Timing. It was not. We didn't cause a virus, yeah. um, no. <laughs> but the uh, you know it, it's it's. Frankly, it's weird in comparison to other solutions that have potentially been around for a hundred years, right? So I'm not, I don't know when yeah. tripods were first created, but it's been a while. Um, yeah. And as a result, sometimes people just, we haven't like honed in on why this is exactly or try to detect it, but there are some people, they really just can't, they're willing to give it a try, but it just doesn't work for them because it's just so strange compared to what they had been thinking of that they just can't manage to understand it. And I unconsciously, because I'm the guy that's in charge of customer success and I talk to customers yeah, all the yeah. time, <clears throat> I would say, look, you know, if it's not for you, you know, I, I'm at the age where I've finally realized not everything I do is brilliant. Not everything yeah. is for everybody. Yeah. So that's perfectly fine. I, just all I, all I ask is tell me what didn't work for you. What were you expecting? How did it not, not happen? Do we, do, we don't work for a certain kind of camera, whatever. And we'll learn from that and we'll... Yeah maybe we have a solution maybe we don't and we just we can say that if you're doing this we're not for you but at the end uh you know this early ending 
um, especially during the pandemic, you know, people will say, I want to return this and get a refund. Yeah. Well, returning things is not useful to us. We're, we want to get more out into the world. So we just say, look, we'll give you a refund, gift it to somebody else who, like a yeah. local school, a library, a nonprofit, whatever, yeah. a therapist, I don't know, um, you know, uh, your cousin. <laughs> and sometimes I put in, or maybe an enemy. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, and they're stunned uh, because when do you ever get treated like that? But, you know, I'll, actually some of our biggest supporters are people who, who tried us, decided it was not for them. But they love the idea and they know that other people can find and, it useful. And stuff like that, I find it it's such a, a good story that it's just engaging in this and thinking, OK, I, I think what I'd like to do is create a good ending for this. And so you, you've given them the money back and then they've got freedom to move on. And so have you. And um, right. amazing how often I speak to businesses, especially like cable companies, and they just can't even tolerate the idea of um, somebody leaving gracefully. So it's always about, uh, and I see this um, in, um, they, they often say like, so at the end, we can do another sale, can't we? <laughs> and it's always like, <laughs> no, you've missed the point of it. This is about creating <laughs> a good ending. Yeah. And, uh, one thing I think you might find interesting is um, as, about good endings and the data is, um, I heard an anecdote when I was researching some of the, the stuff I'm doing. Um, somebody goes into a big, big company, a big digital company, let's say, global one, you'd know of them. And uh, okay. they uh, think, um, I think we should probably design a good ending because this one just sucks and no one can get out of this business. And they were like, yeah, but if this is, a, I think, really a, such a illogical and also it goes to prove how few people really think it through. And it's so common as well, is that yeah. if we create a good ending, more people will leave. And they're like, where did you get that? anyway this person said that's i don't think that's going to be the case and i know right. i've got loads of data that proves that's not the case in any of these scenarios um uh -huh. anyway so they go ahead and make this <laughs> ending this good ending right and so two things happen in this um in the flow so the flow of the previous the bad ending let's say they keep trying to stop the consumer leaving and then they finally leave and then they ask them questions about why they left the consumer at this point is so angry with this company, they give terrible data and they and really and give them no data as well. Yeah. The other option, the good ending that this person designed was, uh, why do you want to leave? And they asked them up front in really positive language. In fact, I think they let them leave really quickly, really conveniently, and then they asked some questions. Okay. And the consumer has yep. gone through this process in a very positive experience and they feel very um, delighted and warm towards the company because most of the time no one's leaving businesses they're either leaving because your product's bad or external factors and most of the time it's external factors unless you're you've got a terrible product but external right. factors um it you know you you shouldn't take responsibility for external factors you should encourage people to leave if they want to leave and then you get good data out. so the consequences of this is that company got such a good amount of really good quality data that it was way worse than doing the the exercise and so mm. they were really they got so much out of a good ending because of the data was so much better they found so many product problems uh, which they wouldn't have found otherwise yeah it's funny. So just thinking back a uh, couple of jobs ago for me, I worked for a, uh, a company that's um, in the U.S. Anyhow, we have some uh, health insurance marketplaces. So yeah. uh, it's very difficult to buy direct from an insurance company for health purposes. Right. You can do it for life and right. all other stuff. But the nature of this business was mostly for small businesses or people who had run out of their COBRA based insurance and needed to right. needed to shop around to, to get a to get the best insurance that they could right. afford made sense and right. a lot of a lot of those processes were horribly broken so i helped fix a lot of them including it would take like 30 days something like 20 to 30 days for us to get rid of somebody you know to actually close them all out and get the data to the right insurance companies at the end wow they wouldn't get their money for 14 to 28 days and i wow. just i was like why is this and it, it wasn't in this case, it wasn't, we're trying to make it hard to leave. It's just because nobody had thought it through. <laughs> and like, well, yeah. if, if you ask for a refund on the 13th, because we process refunds twice a month yeah. on the 14th and the 28th, 
they'll we'll trigger that one the next day. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I said, well, it's their money, and this is potentially hundreds or thousands of dollars. Yeah. What's so what? Why do we only do it twice a month? And it wasn't because they were trying to keep them from leaving. It was just because that process nobody had looked at it. <laughs> like, I all right, find, can we so just make it easy? So you know how many calls yeah. we get for people saying, "Why the hell don't I have my money?" <laughs> totally, I, I find that so frustrating. That um, and it happens time and time again. If you've got a big company, they'll plow so much money into customer experience teams and customer experience initiatives and training, and they'll. So they will have this really polished onboarding usage period and they have the worst, that, that sort of thing, not out of um, intent, but out of right. overlooking this quadrant, which is a third of the consumer life cycle. If you think onboarding one component, usage another component, the offboarding experience is experienced by the consumer. Yep. And if you haven't looked at it, you are wasting so much of your brand equity. Right. Well, in this case, it was also... Uh, the nature of it was the, you know, small businesses were the clientele yeah. and also people that had been unemployed. The reason they're leaving the company is you uh, almost always externally. They got a job. That job yeah. provides health insurance. So they don't yeah. need it with us. So the last thing we should do is irritate them so they never want to come back to us. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, isn't this somewhat obvious? So I guess I was, I've been thinking more about endings than I, that I thought I had, which I... I think I'm happy about it. and now I'm definitely going to pay more attention. <laughs> so thank I, you for, I find for that, writing engineering. I, I think that's the gift I give to everyone is that you're, <laughs> and I was, I was saying this to a group of people I was training the other day, you're going to come out of here and your whole world will be upside down. You're going to look at everything in the supermarket as how does that end? How does that end? Does that end? <laughs> and, uh, and it is weird. You go around in a very different view world, the uh, worldview about, about it. So uh, it's fascinating. Yeah. It's, I, I get that with almost everything that I dive into, like I, I was trying to teach myself how to do 3D modeling back in the, <laughs> the early 90s. Yeah. So then everything that I saw was like, how would you make that as a model? Oh, you'd have to extrude yeah. that and you'd have to cut out there. And, oh yeah, and I know what you mean. I've, I've had that experience, yeah. <laughs> it's like, that's an extruded, <laughs> yeah, right. exactly. But yeah. <laughs> it's like, funny, isn't wait, it? How you can why do I know your worldview no. like that. Yeah. Yeah, well, same thing with like, um, uh not not jacob nielsen uh don norman the the book that has the like impossible yeah, yeah. Um, um pouring psychology you know, of everyday things or was it something uh, like that it's, yeah it had two different job it had two titles didn't it, it got republished with the yeah title. yeah exactly but you know the, anyway. the, there's tons yes. of examples of yes. uh like glass doors is should the handle yeah. be vertical or horizontal yeah. how do you know does it go both ways only one way now we have tons of videos of people smacking straight into a pane of glass it shatters yeah. and you know it, <laughs> yeah. it doesn't end well but when i you know the same thing like at the time our office had a door just like the bad example that uh that don norman had in the book yeah i was like and this is why the receptionist sees people face plant all day long <laughs> yeah oh, <laughs> so wow. i think i think i actually reached out to the the building management to say can we can we do something to change this because it was just a huge wall of glass and it was yeah. You couldn't you couldn't ignore somebody hitting it when it was like 30 feet of glass <laughs> yeah so i know we're, we're about to run out of time so what i like to okay. throw out at the end here is the the title of the podcast uh, and vlog is next feature today so based on endings if there was one thing that people could do today that gets them a step further in thinking about endings or recognizing what their endings even are what would you recommend Definitely, I recommend reading the book. It's really well designed yes. and, and, and nice to consume. Beyond that. <laughs> it's the, so the latest one is engineering and the previous one. And if you're interested in doing it practically, engineering, but if you're interested in the history, philosophy, then the older one. Okay. Ends. Okay. But All one right. thing, if it was one thing, I, I think just uh, look at some of the products you have and think about... Uh, Give an estimate of how long you think that's going to last in years. Or mm. you could just open up the drawer of your desk and see all of the old mobile phones you've got in there and uh, <laughs> think about how they haven't ended properly. Right. Yeah. And there's, there, there are zombie phones that you can't kill, like the, the famous Nokia designs that, you know, you could, you could toss <laughs> from the Empire State Building and 
they'll yeah. still be alive <laughs> yeah 3310 i think i used to work at nokia it was uh it was pretty fun there's a lot of those phones in the world I and mean, probably most of them are still working <laughs> right yeah they just won't die which maybe we should yeah. go back in that direction i don't know well, Joe, so I'm so glad that we finally made this this happen. Um, oh, time me is everything. too, Dan. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, for anybody that wants to catch up with Joe, if you can go to andend.co. Oh, I meant, to, I meant to mention. So I have Danish ancestry. So there's something in my DNA about sort of that minimalistic, clean design that's from Northern Europe and Scandinavia. So I, I, I love your, your website. It's beautifully designed. And I like the, oh, the whole intent behind your book, too. It's, it's just like, oh, Brilliant. this thanks. is... This is beautiful. It's easy to read. Large print, maybe because I'm getting old. That part's more important to me than <laughs> <Yeah>. some people. <laughs> That's something I like now, Dave, as well. Yeah. yeah. Well, I really appreciate that, Dan. Thank you very much. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So thank you again. And I, hopefully, if you have another book in you, let me know. I'm happy to help. Uh, I know it's uh, it can be a lonely time as an author. But uh, you know, if I can help you in any way, let, just let me know. Yeah, I will. Thanks very much. And uh, thanks for having me on the podcast. I really enjoyed it. It's brilliant. Awesome. Thanks, Joe. Cheers. Bye. All right, so let me hit stop. And we're at